Greetings! My name is Anne Glegg. I'm an Associate Professor of Religion and Cultural Studies at the University of Central Florida. My research speciality is North American Buddhist convert lineages. Um, my first book, American Dharma, Buddhism Beyond Modernity, um, came out in 2019 um, and has received a lot of positive attention. And I'm also the first scholar trained solely in American Buddhism to serve on the AAR Buddhism uh, unit. Now, I begin with this not to show off, um, but because I really want to emphasize that both the scholarship and the pedagogy produced by the scholars in this series has been innovative and transformative across areas such as Buddhism and critical race theory, feminism, queer theory, disability studies and trauma studies. And that's not a coincidence. Scholars who have been subject to dominant culture, hostility, marginalisation, exclusion and even abuse have often had to think from the margins. And as we've learned from intersectional feminists, while the margins is a site of institutional vulnerability and loneliness, it is also a site of generativity and creativity um, and connectivity. So I wanted to really forefront intellectual generativity in particular because I think there is a tendency to think of effective experience and interpersonal experience and power structures as somehow distinct from intellectual life. There is a strong dominant culture message that academia is only about intellectual life and we shouldn't be bothering with um, the emotional or structural dimensions of the field. Now, I strongly reject this perspective and I actually see it itself as a form of violence, a kind of forced disembodiment of the scholar um, and an erasure of the material conditions that produce, shape and limit scholarship. Um, of course, it's also a power strategy, a way to deflect and dismiss complaints that, are some, that they are somehow not um, anything to do with real scholarship. So all the contributors of this series have been inspired by Sara Ahmed's brilliant work on complaint. Ahmed has examined complaints of sexism and racism in a university context in order to illuminate how power operates in, in, in wider institutional contexts. The work of complaint is risky. Ahmed herself left academia as a result of her work with complaint. Um, but the work of complaint is also transformative. The work of complaint opens up new possibilities of thinking, feeling and being together. We find Ahmed's concept of complaint collectives particularly generative. So a complaint collective is, quote, a feeling we have of being there for each other, with each other, because of what we've been through. We recognise each other from what we have been through. We even know each other. It can be hard to convey in writing how much that feeling matters. So for my contribution to this Complete Collective series, I want to share three experiences I've had with white male Scott colleagues in the field which illuminate problematic intersections between scholar demographics and knowledge production, reception and legitimation. In other words, I want to reflect on the relationship between the body of the scholar and the body of scholarship produced. Now, by body here, I refer to the social body, the body marked by race, gender and class. Um, but I also want us to remember that the social body is a psychosomatic body. It's a body that contracts 
legs, a body that tightens and braces, a body that lies awake at night with racing thoughts, and it's a body that is subject to both micro and macro aggressions in Buddhist studies. So in other words, there's kind of a lot at stake in reflecting on the type of bodies that produce certain types of scholarship and the types of bodies that um, obstruct or dismiss or disrespect that scholarship. Okay, complaint one. I arrive late at night in Australia to give a paper for a conference. At breakfast, I meet the senior white male faculty at the university hosting the conference. He's American, so I ask him how he ended up in Australia. Affirmative action, he declares with a big smile. I'm confused. Does affirmative action include international scholars in Australia, I ask? Oh no, he clarifies. I came here because I couldn't get a job in Buddhist studies in the United States as a white man. I'm speechless. We are Facebook friends and he knows I'm a progressive queer. He doesn't miss a beat, however, and continues to tell me that the female faculty at his previous liberal arts position were all unhappy because they had nothing to complain about. His students loved him and he was the most qualified candidate for the job, but they couldn't hire him because he was a white man. He isn't being provocative or confrontational. He is genuinely friendly. He truly believes this is an appropriate welcome conversation for a progressive queer guest scholar. I wonder about the person of colour or white woman who did get the job. I wonder about the experience of being at a school or in a field where people think you got the job because you were a person of colour or because you were a woman. On the last day of the conference, I'm on a panel with another white woman and a woman of colour. Our research represents LGBTQI Buddhists in North America, England and Australia. Our papers each illuminate the sincere, careful and creative ways our populations negotiate their commitments as queer and racialized young Buddhists in the 21st century. The senior male scholar responds to our panel that our interlocutors are, quote, just doing what they want, dating whom they want and calling it Buddhism, end quote. He seems to find this hilarious. Each one of us corrects him. Our subjects are not faithfully following 15th century Tibetan commentaries, true, but neither are they just doing what they want and calling it Buddhism. As each of us had just clearly explained, our populations are carefully applying Buddhist ethics, such as non-harm and right speech, to their specific cultural contexts. They are doing, in other words, what religious actors have always done, adapt, adjust and live religion through their specific social and historic bodies. Afterwards, I try to connect with him personally. I know it can be vulnerable to be corrected in a room full of other scholars, even when you are the senior scholar in the room. I'm sorry we gave you such a hard time, I say, but you really misrepresented our research and our research populations. I hope he learned something. He hasn't, because nine months later I'm at a session at the AAR where the scholar is responding to a major book on sexuality in Buddhism. In the Q&A he refers to our panel. He repeats exactly what he said at our panel with exactly the same effect. He does not mention that all three of us corrected his misrepresentation of our research. I have no choice but to stand up in a room of about 150 scholars and correct him 
now for the third time on his misrepresentation of scholarship on marginalised Buddhists by three female junior scholars. I'm shaking and I just hope that my voice remains steady. I honestly have no memory of what I said. To my relief though, several people in the audience stand up and clap when I finish. Afterwards, three female faculty come up to me to thank me for speaking out and two of them share similar experiences of misrepresentation and disrespect from their male colleagues. A complaint is made by an individual but it always points to a collective experience. Complaint 2. I'm invited to give a lecture from American Dharma at a Research One University where one of the giants of Buddhist studies teaches. Giant has a reputation for roasting colleagues at the AAR. Some colleagues, mostly but not exclusively men, seem to find this impressive. Others, mostly but not exclusively women, find it inappropriate and tiresome. My lecture contextualize, contextualizes efforts by American Buddhists of colour to challenge whiteness in their communities. After I finish my talk, the giant of the field and I get into a heated debate, which culminates with him walking to the front of the room, almost next to me, and declaring, this isn't Buddhist, there's nothing Buddhist about this, in reference to my black Buddhist populations. The next question comes from the second most senior scholar in the room, also a white man. He asks, can you talk about monasticism? I'm confused. Not really, I respond. My paper was about lay Buddhists. He suggests that the issues of racism and whiteness are because American Buddhists aren't rooted in monastic authority. I'm confused. I think about the Burmese monastics instigating violence against the Rohingya people. I and the two senior male scholars go for dinner afterwards. The monastic focus scholar keeps beginning and ending his sentences with, do you understand? It's so patronising that I actually have to say to him in the middle of our dinner, X, I'm an associate professor, stop talking to me like I'm an undergraduate. I think he realises he has crossed a line because he insists on walking me back to my hotel and is super friendly. I enjoy our talk on the way home, but later at night I wonder how many male scholars have had to tell a colleague to stop talking to them like they were an undergraduate in a dinner after a research talk. I wonder what my experience would have been like for a female graduate student or a junior faculty. <clears throat> I don't have to wait long. On the long flight home, I, e I email with a friend who is a junior female scholar. She tells me that she gave a research talk on Buddhism and a lay, on lay Buddhism and environmental issues. And the very same scholar asked her the very same question. Can you talk about monasticism? The scholar studies Japanese Pure Land Buddhism. I think about the discrimination faced by the Burukamen people, a low caste group in Japan. I wonder what oriented the scholar to monastic elites rather than the marginalised Burukamen. I think a lot about the relationship between white male scholars and the assertion of text and monastic authority as stamps of what counts as real Buddhism. I write a Twitter post that asks, how can we respect text and tradition without reproducing elite power dynamics? I notice many female colleagues like it. A complaint is made by an individual, but it always points to a collective experience.
Complaint 3. I co-write an article on the backlash that racial justice work has generated from white Buddhists. Reviewer 1 asks us to clarify our methodology. Is the essay descriptive or critical normative? Both are valid methods, he asks, he stresses, sorry, but we need to clarify. Reviewer 2 also comments that he doesn't agree with our methodology. In our revisions, we clarify that we are writing from the anthropologist lineage of post-colonial feminists and reference Nancy Shepper Hughes's Ethics of Witnessing, in which fieldwork is intentionally taken with a commitment to marginalised populations. Reviewer 1 is enthusiastic and heartily endorses the, re the revised version. Reviewer 2, however, urges the editor working on the piece to take his complaint that the article is too political to be published by the journal to the other editors of the journal. Reviewer 2, in effect, tries to cancel our article being published because he doesn't agree with our post-colonial feminist ethnographic approach. I know who the reviewer is. This is a complaint that hurts the most. He is someone I considered a real friend. He's also a white man. I'm churned up thinking about it. Should I confront him directly? If I do, how will it impact future research opportunities? How will I handle seeing him at the small conferences that often make up our field? I write to a few female friends to share the emotional burden. One says she is not surprised and shares some remarks he has made to her that echo this attitude against intersectional scholarship. She feels with me. We both appreciate and genuinely like this man, but he has literally tried to stop an article being published, a feminist anti-racist article being published on the grounds that it is too political. A complaint is made by an individual but always points to a collective experience. Conclusion, why complain? So I share these complaints not to shame the individual men involved. Many of them I like, one I considered a real friend, all have produced excellent scholarship, for the most part. I share because, as this series shows, complaints speak to the collective experience of other marginalised scholars in the field. Scholars of colour, female, non-binary, transgender scholars. Our scholarship and by association, our credentials as scholars has been routinely dismissed, interrogated and disrespected. I share because these are experiences we have had at every level of the academy, from undergraduate to full professors. I share because complaints are made by individuals often against individuals, but always point to collective experience, structural conditions and institutional cultures. Moreover, as Ahmed writes, the point of complaint is to intervene in the reproduction of harmful institutional cultures. As she explains, you have to record what you don't want to be reproduced. Reproduction is, quote, a scene of instruction. Norms and values are passed on for new postgraduate students. A complaint is a refusal of that instruction, a refusal to pass on the same thing. If you complain because a culture is being re reproduced, you complain in order to stop that culture from being reproduced. 
a complaint can come out of a sense that the culture will will be reproduced unless you do what you can to try and stop it. We can thus think of complaint as non-reproductive labour, as the work you have to do in order not to reproduce an inheritance." End quote. So for me then, this series is an invitation for us all to learn how we can avoid reproducing institutional cultures of harm in Buddhist studies and religious studies. This involves first recognising and naming the harm. Second, thinking about the ways we all, but especially white male scholars, inherit, internalise and reproduce that harm. And third, intervening and dis disrupting that reproduction of that culture. Now, such interventions involve labour. They are exhausting and they also make one vulnerable to retaliation. I've been called a whiny feminist, a bully, a scholar of wokeism and not Buddhism, amongst other things, by male colleagues. Not coincidentally, these echo the insults my scholarship on racial justice has received from white male Buddhists. I've been called a delusional feminist, a pseudo-scholar, and accused of perverting the Dharma, amongst other things. That's why we need the collective as well as a complaint. Because a collective complaint is a feeling we have of being there for each other, with each other because of what we have been through. We recognise each other from what we have been through. We know each other. It can be hard to convey in writing how much that feeling matters. So I just want to end by thanking Francis Garrett for conceiving this space for us to share our complaints in order to dis disrupt institutional cultures of harm and thank all the other Buddhist feminist killjoys uh, using Sharon Su's uh, term and thank everyone for listening and to really encourage all listeners to think about how they have internalised and inherited cultures of harm in Buddhist studies and how they can disrupt those cultures in, in ways that make sense to them. Okay, thank you.